Monty Lyman is a pioneering medical doctor on a mission to break down the perceptual barriers between body and brain. In this conversation, Monty generously shares a range of free things we can try to overcome chronic health challenges. These include education about how our bodies work, as well as techniques that were once viewed as esoteric, such as visualization. But these can all be understood now in um, terms of modern models of how our brains our prediction making machines. I'm sure you will enjoy what he has to say and please remember to subscribe to the Inner Sense channel for more of this type of information to help you improve your inner sense of body awareness and overall well-being. Thank you very much. So hello Monty, thank you so much for joining us on the Inner Sense channel. Ian, thanks so much for having me on. Delighted to be here. I've been looking forward to this conversation for a long time. Um, you know, not only because your work is fascinating, but because of uh, the, the topics that you work on. It's closely related to my sort of day-to-day -day work of um, working with people in either manual therapy or health coaching and hearing people's stories about their kind of pain and other types of discomfort and suffering. So the way that you approach that really does inspire me. So maybe we could start by hearing a little bit about your background and how your um, personal and clear career journey ended up to you, you with you becoming uh, practicing a medical as a medical doctor as well as an author and a research fellow at the University of Oxford your sort of field of study there is really particular uh, of interest to me you're sort of studying the brain body connection and have covered topics um, including chronic pain and what I hope we get to cover as well is this sort of upcoming piece of research of yours looking at the relationship between the immune system and mental health so how did you arrive where you are today yeah that's a yeah um really interesting, interesting question i'll make sure i um yeah, obviously it's, it's sort of um how i got to where i am is often more interesting to me than to, to your listeners so i'll be as concise as i can <laughs> but i'm um so i'm currently a, a doctor specializing in in psychiatry but yeah as you said i'm also an academic clinical fellow here in Oxford, so part of my time, most of my time is clinical, and part of my time is is research. Um, and uh, I'm really interested in the relationship between um, the brain and the body, whether that's um, with with pain, whether it's with the relationship to, between the immune system and mental health. And why I went into medicine, I was I've, I think I've always sort of treaded along the um, the line between. Uh, mind and, and body I initially wanted to maybe do do humanities philosophy or something like that um, and I think the thing that probably pushed me into medicine was that my my mum was a nurse and just seeing the kind of the, the effects of the you know the, that she had on, on on patients and that kind of that clinical interaction with patients was something I really wanted to do um, so yeah, I went to uh, Birmingham Medical School initially quite interested one of the reasons I, I I went there was that at the time I was quite interested in military medicine and trauma and surgery and stuff like that which is what they're, they're very good at and then quite early on realized I wasn't very interested in surgery it wasn't very, it wasn't very coordinated but actually I was more interested in um, the immune system and I ended up doing a um, part of my medical degree called inter intercalation so it's a master's essentially in immunology in Oxford um, specifically looking into uh, skin immunology and then that um, led me into writing a popular science book about the skin called The Remarkable Life of the Skin, um, and, and which was published in 2019. But when I was writing that book, I the chapters that made me really interested were actually the chapters about how uh, psych the relationship between the, the mind and skin, how skin affects the mind and how mind and psychology affects the skin. And long story short, I ended up converting to um, psychology and psychiatry and ended up going down that pathway. Um, and I've written, I wrote a book called The Painful Truth about, um, about pain, um, which came out last year. And I'm currently researching for a book, uh, on, on a book about the relationship between um, the mind and the immune system, which I find really interesting. So balancing lots of, lots of different things. Mm, mm. Yes. So um, as, as um, you're probably aware, this channel is all about interoception. So it's kind of the signals we get from inside our body, which mm. immune state of our immune system is, is part of that. Um, but yeah, it's nice to hear that background, actually, where you've got this kind of almost this, your career has got some curiosity about this sort of multi-sensory multi way that we um, 
experience the world and how that integrates into our ability to function i guess um yeah so, I think it's, it's, it's a wonderful time for it and, and and the work that you do you, you do as well it's it's just a really exciting time because actually the understanding the, the relationship between the, the brain and the body was i mean it, it was like a black box until fairly recently and actually the the technologies that we have and the research that we have is just is growing at such a such a large rate um in the last in the last 10 20 years so i think it's just a really exciting field to be in mm, and that excitement i think came through in your book i found out about you and your work through your second book the painful truth and i think i can see a uh, copy of it on the, the bookshelf <laughs> behind you there and I, I sort of found it really beautifully accessible um for for people with different backgrounds uh, you, you know you covered your clinical experience as well as um personal stories and some sort of more um academic research <clears throat> and there were some stories i'd like to if you can recall and share them now um mm -hmm. Firstly, the, the one where you compared two experiences of running along a beach where that involved kind of um, pain in your foot or your heel. Uh, but there were very different experiences separated by, was it like 20 or 30 years maybe? Um, and I'll let you explain, but they, for me, there were such great examples about the complex ways in which we experience pain um, based on you know, past experience and what things might be important to us in the present moment. Um, so can you share those and maybe ex sort of rationalise how you might understand those two different experiences in light of some of these more um, interesting, exciting models like predictive uh, predictive processing and so on? Yeah, of course. Um, you know, um, but yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a, the, the, sort of the, beat, the running on the beach um, story was quite um, interesting to me because actually it was the, the, the first um, uh, the first experience was during my uh, early on in, in medical school and I felt that actually during that that period I learned more about pain than I did through my uh, my lectures about pain at, at, at medical school so basically I I think in the summer after summer between my second and third years of medical school I went to on holiday with um, some friends from um, from university I went to a uh, by a beach in in West Wales and a lot of the people were quite um, quite sporty and uh, we're very, very into beach cricket or cricket generally. And I, I have to say, I really don't like cricket. I find it really, really boring. I'm sorry for offending <laughs> listeners. And that's probably because I myself am not very coordinated at all and I'm terrible at it. So we were out on a beach uh, in West Wales um, and the captain of one of the, one of the teams, I mean, I could, could try and explain cricket to, to maybe their American listeners. It's basically like baseball. I don't, don't know much, much else than that. But basically I was a member of the fielding team so I had to be sort of um trying to catch the ball that, that were, the balls that were hit um but because they knew I was so badly coordinated they would put they put me really far away right at the edge of the um um the game which I was really happy with I could just sort of look at the sea and just take it all in and just have you know, think to myself um and during that game uh, long story short I was I was running uh, to try and catch one of the balls and I noticed ever so slightly i'm not even sure i really noticed it but i'm thinking about it um my right foot just gently jerk upwards i wouldn't i wouldn't have called it pain and i kept running and i think i assumed you know maybe i was running it was a sandy beach but maybe i was running across a slightly it's sharper than usual pebble um then nothing happened for for a few minutes we went back to uh waiting you know waiting on, on the edges to try and catch the ball and then I noticed behind me a sort of a serpentine like figure in the sand and I spun around and the sort of snake like sort of white figure seemed to be following me. And then I suddenly suddenly clicked that it was a uh, piece of fishing wire that was attached to the bottom of my right foot. And then as I looked at my right foot, there was a quite a sizable uh, rusty fish hook that was embedded deep in my um, in, in the ball of my foot. And then that's when the pain started. And I'd say it was about sort of six out of 10. I mean, you can't read you know, pain necessarily like that, but it, I'd say it was about a six out of 10. And then all of my, all of my friends came over to have a look and said, oh, that's, that's really disgusting. That's amazing. And I was kind of I was quite sort of proud, distracted by them, sort of showing it off to them. The pain went down to a, about a four. And then when I sort of extracted myself from the match and sat on the side of the harbour wall, looking at it, look, looking at the, um, the fish, deciding whether to, go to A&E or pull it out myself 
the pain went up to an eight. And you know, when I actually imagined the movements of trying to pull the hook out of my foot, pain went up to a nine or a 10. Um, and that got me really interesting because I realized that, so I had one tissue injury, one specific tissue injury. And at one point I had no pain. One point I had six out of 10 that went down to four, then went up to eight to nine. So actually I was beginning to realize that actually pain isn't necessarily a marker of tissue injury. So that was one key thing that I um, took from that. And that's a, a key thing that I write about in the book. But going back to the, the second beach incident, which was uh, just a year later, I was on a similar beach in a similar area uh, with my parents um, a year later. Oh, and I was going for a morning jog along the, um, uh, along the beach with my parents' two dogs. Um, it, the run was going absolutely fine. And then suddenly I had a searing pain shoot up my right leg that made me yank my right leg up and I lost balance and fell over onto the sand. Terrible pain in my in my right foot. Uh, and then when I looked at the right foot, sort of roughly in the same area where I had the fish hook incident the year before, I had r run over a pebble, very not, not even a sharp pebble, and there, there was the tiniest of scratches. It, it, was, it wasn't even bleeding. Um, but so what was happening in that second incident was that um, essentially, I'm distilling it down, my essentially my subconscious brain, completely outside of my uh, awareness, was receiving signals from my foot. And it was receiving not pain signals, because we can talk about this, it's no such thing as a pain signal, it's a danger signal, otherwise it's a nociceptive signal. It was going up to my brain. And then my brain was essentially deciding um, it was looking at the context. So I'm on a beach. Um, my foot has touched something slightly sharp, um, but it's not just looking at the context. It's um, our, our brains are processing machines that base that everything is on prior experiences. And they update that on what sensory information comes in. And essentially my, my brain had decided, I think definitely fair enough that stepping on this relatively sharp object in a beach in West Wales, I think it's probably going to be something dangerous, like a fish hook. What happened last year, you know, that it's sort of penetrated through the skin, it could be very dangerous. Um, so it decided, my brain decided to create um, an experience of pain, even though the, the actual damage itself was tiny. Um, so I think it sort of touches on the fact that you know, pain isn't a measure of tissue injury. And also, pain remembers our, our brain is constantly creating our um, our experience i realize there are lots of kind of quite big um i've, I've brought up quite a, quite a lot of complex topics but um but that's the sort of that's what those those two stories sort of touch on great yeah and i i, I, I think they speak volumes really and um we'll we'll stick with the topic of pain for a while but uh that principle of what the what the um the brain or the nervous system was trying to do in those moments those two instances was to as you said it was trying to kind of assess the, the situation and say okay is it safe for me to be doing this sort of thing or mm. not but it's quite interesting both you know when 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 you felt those sensations on the heel both times they both contained some kind of error or mistake didn't they in calculation mm. so the mm. first time you thought oh no you know the sand is fine must just be a little pebble but there was actually was a real threat, um, but you didn't detect it. And then the second time there wasn't a real threat, um, but based on the past experience, the calculation was, oh, it must be a threat. So it's quite, it's, it's interesting that we can easily make mistake, our senses are easily mm. fooled. Um, mm. And that's not just limited to the domain of pain either, is it, from what I understand, you know, there's these people say that all of our, present experience is a kind of um best guess in any moment um, yeah and i think the, the visual the visual uh, system is probably the best for that and visual illusions are are a very good way of explaining that actually you know our you know our our perceptions our, our brain the, the, the aim of the perception is not to have a completely accurate um record of what's going on in the outside world like sort of a video recorder it's it's so that we have a meaningful um, perception of the outside world that, as you, as you said about safety, is one that protects us, makes us survive and thrive. Um, so, yes, so, I mean, uh, there's a, a great quote from um, Gerald Edelman, which is that um, experiences are uh, remembered presence. 
so all experiences whether it's an, an emotion whether it's pain or something like that are being are constructed on a lot, all of our past experiences and that kind of relationship between the the signals of what's coming on out there in the world or inside our bodies and everything that's come before it um and yeah, that, 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 that's led to the idea that, you know, all of our perception, in a sense, is a, a controlled hallucination and that our brains mm-hmm. are sort of entombed inside a, a, a sort of silent and dark um, box. And actually what we what we experience is what we need to, um, what we need to do to, to survive. It, and um, I think pain is sort of, the signals that are coming up are only as important as, is what they mean, if that makes sense. So, um, yeah, uh, as you say, the, the visual system is a great example in that the, those, um, I think you included Adelson's checkerboard in, in your mm-hmm. in your book. Um, that can easily be Googled and just to, as an example of how, you know, how convincing sometimes these um, uh, predictions and er- errors are. Um, even when we try try to try to be aware of them, they still fool us sometimes. Um, so let's let's go back to pain for a moment. And in in your book, the painful truth, you kind of um, state as as you you said now that the function of pain is to protect us from uh, real or perceived threats, which is a really helpful, useful kind of um, protective tool to have. Um, although it might not always be a good detector of damage and your experience on the beach was uh, sort of demonstrated that um now so you know i i've been sort of aware of this concept for for several years and practicing and you know part of what i try to do when i'm working with people um face to face is to sometimes reassure them and give them confidence about their body um, and the function of their body and to Mm. um help them soothe any fear or catastrophizing around pain um if we've ruled out any other kind of um mm. real threats now so so what, what we've just talked about sounds you know it, for some people it might sound far-fetched um especially when you're in in a huge amounts of pain or suffering mm. in a clinical setting setting how do you try to get this message across succinctly in a way that helps people if they are um really distressed about pain or other types yeah, of suffering that's that's a really really good question and I think the first thing is it's completely different for everyone. Um, but some of the core messages that I'd I, I'd want to come across, uh, get across is that um, pain is completely real. Pain is real. Um, you know, pain can be created in the brain, but that's not all in your head. I think that's that's key. No matter you know, whether it's saying it like that or saying it in a different way, I think that's a key message. Key message. Um, and then also messages that are there are quite a few. Um, uh, um, uh, charities and sort of pain education groups that try to get some core messages across. Um, and one of the one of them is flipping pain. And I think I think they've got quite a good a quite a good uh, system of of sort of phrases that they use or things that they focus on. And they hang lots of evidence behind it, but it's quite quite sort of um, it's quite clear. So I think that their sort of uh, persistent pain is common. Anyone can experience persistent pain. Hurt doesn't always equal harm. It's one of their other ones. I think that's a that's a key one. Understanding that pain is often a very accurate measure of tissue damage for short term injury, but the longer the time between the injury and the pain, so the longer pain goes on, the more disconnected they become, and pain be- can become essentially wired in the brain. Um, and it's complete. It's as real as as epilepsy. You know, it's just it's it's, it's that's it's, it's to, often to do the pain the, the, the brain's wiring. Um, another message is, is that understanding pain can be key. So the very process of, of um, understanding what pain is and what pain isn't, you know, it's not going to cure you, cure you of your pain in and of itself, but it is a key to helping you do things that are, I like to call making your brain feel safe in its body. Um, I think understanding pain is key. And then I like to say have hope. And I think some other um, groups say things, things like recovery is possible. Um, in that there's a lot of lots of evidence that um, that through, through different through different methods, um, persistent pain can be reduced significantly and it can be possible to, to to live with it, and 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 even eliminated. But obviously, that you know, depending on what kind of pain it is, who the person is, it you have to um, you know um, communicate it that differently. But those are some of the core truths, and I think 
um, something that is done in acceptance and commitment therapy, which is something that I like. It's, I, I don't I don't practice it, but I've looked into it, and I'm not saying that's the, the one thing that one should do for persistent pain. Definitely not. But it is the idea of acceptance, so understanding that your pain's real and you're in a bad you're in a bad place at the moment, but also holding hope as well. And holding those two things are really really important. And having having someone help them through that is, is so important. All all the evidence suggests that societal influences things like loneliness oppression racism whatever it is um can worsen can worsen pain and i think there is a huge duty to those who are looking duty and opportunity for those looking um uh, looking after or looking out for or knowing people who are living in persistent pain if that, if that makes sense mm. yeah that um, does. Mm. so there are quite a lot of yeah again a lot, a lot of different elements in that but i think those are some of the key things that um i think it's important to know to know about pain mm. Mm, yeah thank you that's uh, an amazingly um kind of wise condensed sort of um set of thoughts and principles for people there so so thank you um and, yeah, um, I think, I think just, to, just to tag on to that i think because you know these things can in and of themselves can sound can sound trite but they are they've come from a huge a huge evidence base which i think is want to get looking into you know good um uh, just understanding what about pain is, is key basically but i think that's a good place to start yes yeah that, that understanding and um we, you uh, i really like that you introduced the that whole segment there with saying that pain is is always real if you if you're mm. feeling it and experiencing it, it's not like um we wouldn't want to be uh to come across as if we're sort of saying it is being imagined or it's um it's blameful for mm. um having mm. pain in the absence of, of damage mm. um mm. And um, yeah, you know this this uh, uh, a multi-dimensional approach as well. You know societal factors and education and so on. Um, I really like the term and ecology of, of uh, approaches mm -hmm. or practices. I've heard a few different um, mm -hmm. practitioners talking about. So um, uh, we have we have had uh, Dr. Yoni Ashar on here, mm -hmm. um, who did the Boulder study on pain, study, which, yeah. pain, which um, is I, th I thought was an amazing piece of work. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I'm really keen to hear another one of your stories, if if you mm. can if you can share your experience of IBS, which, um, mm. as I understand it, had a big uh, one component. You suspect was the um, huge amounts of stress from um, work and study and so on. Uh, can you explain some of the sort of learning you've done about that and uh, what you've taken to approaches you've taken to um, improve or lessen your experience of IBS? And I don't understand that included uh, hypnotherapy um yeah so what's the what's the 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 what what's the journey you've been on with that yeah well this is something i didn't never expected to write about or experience i have lived with well i've been yeah, ibs free for a couple of couple of years but i've i'd lived with ibs for all my teen all my teenage years and most of my 20s um and it's it was really debilitating quite a lot most of the time it was sort of embarrassing or a bit sort of inconvenient but sometimes I couldn't even get out of bed um because it was so painful and um was often I you know, I, I tried lots of sort of elimination diets and different various different things uh and none of them really helped and I, I had a sense that it was related to if I was stressed or anxious um it would often manifest as that um and I interviewed a, um, a hypnotherapist early on in my research for, for the painful truth. Um, and I was, because I'd, I'd seen quite a, a lot of, sort of good evidence um, about the use of hypnotherapy in, in various um, long-term pain conditions. And the hypnotherapist said, do you have any, have any long-term pain conditions? I said, well, yeah, I've got, um, got IBS, but um, I sort of didn't assume that it all wouldn't, you know, wouldn't, I didn't really want to try hypnotherapy. I think at medical school, I don't, it wasn't mentioned at all. And you know, the only kind of images I had of, of hypnosis was of sinister or, or comic of you know, people getting people to sort of walk around like uh, sort of clucking like chickens. Or <laughs> the idea of hypnosis is something where you lose control and someone's taking a power over you. That's that's what I assumed it was. Um, but essentially, we did uh, one hypnotherapy session about my uh, my IBS. And I think a key part of that was was visualization. Really, it was it was you know at no point did I lose control. It was essentially a state of um, 
relaxation where I could just turn the spotlight of my attention on different things in the room, whether it was the ticking clock, which I hadn't been listening at all. But if he asked, if he said, oh, can you uh, focus your attention on that and on this? Um, and then he got me to focus in on my, um, basically on, on, on my, sort of my, my painful abdomen and got me to, uh, so this is based in, based in Oxfordshire. So he got me to imagine that at the moment they're like rocky rapids, but try and imagine them as, as the, the languid river Thames with punts floating down it. And then recorded it. And every morning for about 15 minutes, I did it. Didn't really do it, make any difference for a couple of weeks. But then it started to make a bit, bit of a difference. And after a couple of months, I have had no, pe- no um, IBS at all. And it's come back very mildly, very rarely. And I, do, I don't do regular hypnosis for that. So that sort of shocked me that I was completely uh, pain-free after episodes of hypnosis. Um, and I think that, that, that taught me that actually it's, and, and looking at research as well, it actually shows you that um, that's one way, not the only way, one way of increasing a sense of interoceptive awareness of um, being able to sit with sensations and disconnect the the avoidance and the fear that I had with them um which is pretty remarkable you know, I'm not saying the hypnosis is the best is the only thing for people with IBS um but for me it was transformative and I think it was um a really good image of old well, well, um experiment about how um sort of visualize visualization visual, visualization and making my my brain feel safe in its body mm-hmm. um completely eliminated this this form of pain Mm. 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 yeah and um you know i've read your book and um and uh, heard your example and plus other i think you mentioned other examples of using visualization um Mm. to reduce reduce pain and um there's a there's a a uh an author called david robson i'm not sure if you're familiar with him he wrote the Mm. expectation Expectation. effect yeah yeah yeah. it's great he covered yeah he sort of covered the um some ex- research on visualization i think he used the example of michael phelps the swimmer on how powerful it is um but you know mm. as you were uh sharing your story then i was sort of thinking how um visualization and this uh, predictive um thing it's really it is you know what we've got this we've got this ability to visualize and to um i've heard it uh called remembering the future basically so we you know it's sort of okay what pattern am i predicting for the future that's i guess we can use it in other ways but maybe from an evolution point of view that's um its purpose i don't know um so you for by tran by transforming sort of the image of your gi tract and your ibs from a you know a rocky violent kind of um, <clears throat> rapids that might be might appear dangerous. You're and predicting it as a um, as a smooth sort of safe, pleasant pl- way to kind of wind down a stream. You really are um, sort of reprogramming your nervous system to uh, create different a different experience for yourself. Is that is that is that right? Definitely, I think visualization is a great way of of of, of updating updating predictions. I think a combination of education and knowing what pain is and and visualization um through what through whatever form can be can be really powerful i mean the mm. most extreme one i came across was a a doctor called michael moskowitz in the in the u.s um uh, who was in, interviewed uh, by norman doidge in the the brain that changes itself and basically he'd he was on one of those um rubber rings i think he's i can't remember how old he was at the time but he was in one of those rub, rubber rings that's sort of towed by a speedboat and he flipped off it and hit his neck really hard and lived for years with um, really bad persistent pain and he took all the medications and tried lots of different things that didn't work but eventually he, he read loads of neuroscience books and thought that you know a huge amount of the brain and the brain's predictive power is is centered around vision actually and he thought well actually why didn't I take back the, the areas of brain that have been taken over with pain why didn't I take back my brain with with vision essentially but actually this could be this could be viewed as updating his prize or updating his predictions um and basically all he did is he um drew one picture of his brain with all the sort of the areas of the, the brain that sort of that light up in pain it's not quite as simple as that but in sort of red and enlarged and then he, he drew another picture of his brain um with those areas shrunk 
And basically, he just whenever he had a flare up, he'd close his eyes and he just imagine imagine the those areas shrinking. Hmm. And it didn't work for for weeks, months, but he did it. He did it sort of religiously every single time. I mean, this is I wouldn't recommend this to necessarily because it requires a lot of lot of willpower. It's probably not the most efficient way of doing it, but hmm. he completely cured it. Hmm. Um, his, his pain by doing that. It took a lot of a lot, a lot of a lot of work to 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 to, to calm his brain down essentially. But yeah, that's hmm. also very. Yeah, um, in both that story and yours, you mentioned about the time period that it might not be an instant fix. Mm-hmm. It might take weeks mm-hmm. or months um, or mm-hmm. possibly years. Mm-hmm. And I guess it, it depends how sort of deeply embedded or hard, you know, how strong the wiring is for the the, the unpleasant thing, um, how long, you know, how quickly you can um, change that. Because um, I guess, you know, there's, there's some things that update really quickly, like our short-term memory is... Mm constantly changing whereas uh other more deeply held reflexes take a long time so uh, again on you know guiding people's hope realistically so you're sort of saying that there's all these different tools all these different ways to remold our experience and our nervous system and brain but they might take some of them might take a bit of um will you know uh, trust and belief and willpower in order for them to start paying off yeah 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 definitely and that's yeah and that's an it's a, it's initially initially hard but i think it's it's definitely it's definitely worth it thank you and, um, and also just uh, yeah and i mean with with our our perception and our, our our predictions about the world context is context is king and i think it's often these things are often harder for people who are um you know living in say say if they um you know are if they're poor if they're trying to manage you know a number of children doing different things if they've got stresses from work if you know, they're suffering abuse not that kind of thing i think it's 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 often it's the kind of, in, in isolation it can be if you've got all of the if all of these social determinants are are, are, are okay then it's then that's then that then it, it's much quicker but actually i think it's un, i think understanding neuroscience in this sense and how embedded we are within as you mentioned so the ecology we are completely embedded within our, our context and we are created by the context as we as we develop as well um and our, and our predictions are constantly being sort of refined and updated um i think that's a huge call for for, for social justice in a sense that actually and, and a huge call for investment in 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 good education and and in trying to eliminate poverty because actually a lot of these um conditions are not necessarily caused by but they can be they can, can be caused by and they can be worsened by and treatment can be made a lot harder um, with these sort of external external factors, so context is so important. But that shouldn't all of that shouldn't um, detract from the fact that that, that there really is hope. Mm, mm, yeah, yeah. So there's lot, lots of simple things we can we can try right away mm-hmm. for free. Um, mm-hmm. Don't cost a penny. Don't you know? Yeah. Might might cry a little bit of time and attention and mm-hmm. um, so on. Um, but yeah, there are you know, like you say, there are bigger sort of maybe societal things. Um, there's mm-hmm. lots of you know. We won't go down the, the route of epigenetic um, factors mm. and all of that, but long term, with this uh, understanding, this new understanding, there's lots of ways, lots of hope for the future for mm. you know creating some systemic change. Mm. Um, so you're, you're uh, as I understand it, you're working on a new book um, based on immunopsychiatry, and um, so that's the you're looking at the relationship between our immune system and our mental health. Um, so why have you moved on to uh this writing this book what's led you down that route i think this is this has been an area that i've been really interested in for a long period of time i've been interested in the brain and how it works for a while but also the immune system and and how that works for a long period of time but actually that my interests are sort of converging i'm always sort of imagine the immune system as a as a as a sort of a mind of its own this complex system that actually works in a very similar way to the brain and that its its purpose is um discriminating between self and non-self between dangerous and and safe um but the more i looked into it and, and actually there's, a, there's so much research that's that's just coming out in the last last few years recently just showing that the immune system and the brain are inseparable and I, one reason why this is so interesting is that at, at medical school and the the prevailing medical thought for the whole of the 20th century was that the brain is immune privileged so the immune system can't access the brain at all because the brain needs to be protected 
to the idea that the brain is this sort of super controller that controls everything in the body and the, and you know the body just sort of responds to that but the immune system can't affect the brain but that couldn't be further from the truth and uh, we now know sort of anatomically in terms of um there we've discovered new anatomy that shows that there are sort of lymph lymphatics so it's sort of immune drainage in the brain we now know that there are immune cells in the brain we know that immune molecules go to the brain we know that the, the the brain and the immune system talk to each other really really intimately and i think we need to sort of visualize them as um essentially two parts of the same defensive system essentially where the the developing immune system whether this is evolutionary development or the development um, our sort of lifespan development the immune system or our mind and microbes um develop with each other and depend on each other so whether that's with the microbiome um which are the microbes that live in and on us or whether it's the immune system which is the system that has developed alongside microbes to, to deal with them um so it's a really really interesting area i'm just at the beginning of my my research for it so it's um daunting as well as exciting but um yeah no yeah, really mm. it is exciting it. how um <clears throat> our thinking around the body and the systems uh, is you know it's it's changing all the time um so with, with this you know um you, you, as you as you said there's there's lots of evidence now of uh, um, a lymph system and mm. immune cells in the brain um but what's what would what would you say you're most curious about at the moment in terms mm. of emer emerging work and uh, what you'd like to explore through mm. your book yeah, I think well, there are lots of different things. I think one thing I'm quite interested. One, one another thing that sort of got me interested. Um, I was already quite interested in, in, in the relationship between the um, the, Im the immune system and and um, uh, and mental health. But um, early on in my psychiatry training, we would do I would um, do a CBT, a twelve week course of CBT with a, with a patient, and who had um, sort of mild to moderate depression, and um, over the course of, sort of five or six weeks, um, the patient's depression scores, it's called PHQ-9, were coming down. So they would record, they'd record their scores before every session. And I was quite sort of quite pleased with myself because you know, they, they were coming down pretty um, pretty steadily and pretty consistently. And then on week seven, or week eight, all of the depression scores had shot up massively. And it turned out that the, um, the patient had caught COVID that week and had, was, was sort of lying in bed and they didn't really say that felt that they were getting more depressed or anything like that but actually quite interestingly almost all of the symptoms of depression and particularly the, the symptoms of a subset of depression map completely onto sickness behavior which is the behavior, behavior that we have when we get sick um so fatigue um low mood Anhedonia. Anhedonia is the sort of the, the loss of ability to feel pleasure in the things that usually give you pleasure. Um, loss of concentration and sort of cognitive abilities, um, uh, and 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 some things like that. Sort of loss of so, um, loss of appetite, sleep affected. Um, and there's a lot of research looking into to, to sickness behaviour and how it is actually how and why the why the mind, what, 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 why you need to know, why your brain needs to know that, that you're sick and why your behaviours need to change. So it's, it's actually, you know, sickness behaviour is a, is a positive, adaptive response to um, you know, being uh, attacked by microorganisms uh, in the same way that sort of fear is a, often a rational response to um, being attacked by a predator or another human. But these are just ones we can't, we can't see. And so... I'm quite interested in how people are, are how researchers are experimenting of causing sickness behavior in, in sort of healthy patients um, and seeing what that tells us about, about the, the body and the brain, um, but also um, seeing where it kind of becomes, it moves from a good adaptive uh, response to something that is um, sort of ruining the, the person, the patient's life, whether it's a sickness behavior that persists, whether it's that, mm. that's it. Mm -hmm. fatigue or depression or or, or, or whatever mm -hmm. in a similar way in which fear and anxiety can be excessive and prolonged out of proportion with threats out in the environment uh and actually to do to do this i actually um, went so i was interviewing a um so a few days ago i was in stockholm um in sweden interviewing Mats lakander who's a, a professor of um neuroimmunology 
uh, the relationship between um, depression and inflammation. And I actually ended up getting uh, jabbed with the um, the typhoid fever um, vaccine, which contains a little bit of the bacteria. Then it caused a, an immune response um, in me that basically made me depressed for a few hours. Um, and I sort of left in early, much to the disappointment of my wife and friends who'd also come to Stockholm. Um, but I mean, I had warned them about that. But um, it was very interesting that I, I was experiencing these 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 symptoms as well. And I plan to, in a few months' time, go to Cardiff and actually um, be given something potentially slightly, something slightly stronger and then go through brain scanners and see what inflammation in the body does to the brain and how it affects behaviour in the mind and what this can tell us about um, various things. Like, for example, depression. Could a sizable portion proportion of people living with what we call depression actually be caused by chronic inflammation or could from the opposite direction could um psychological therapies of various kinds affect and reduce um, um inflammation or change someone's perception about um how they're interpreting signals from the body mm. um so lots of different strands but i think i kind of this sort of inflammation and depression is a particularly interesting one um but I mean, lots of other very interesting areas. So autoantibodies uh, attacking the brain is another and causing psychosis. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Gut microbiome, um, new research into how um, dementia might be worsened by um, by inflammation and things like that. So I think it's a, I'm going to try and it's going to be quite broad, but I'm going to try and um, just keep that sort of essentially the, the, the book. Will, I will try and knock down the wall between brain and body that that you know that science and society has been building for hundreds of years I mm. that's, that's one of the aims mm. wow uh, i could talk all i could you know all those things you just mentioned i could kind of um yeah, dive, sorry, into, dive into dive into no no i'm just, I, I'm just thinking, it's yeah, yes but, it's um, really really exciting um you know that just the idea that it's uh that our um responses or behaviors uh, that we might categorize as being ill or um in some kind of deficit you know i'm thinking also um uh things like adhd and autism where we've we've decided that these are these are suboptimal actually um reframing them as adaptive responses mm, to mm. our you know um, a, a, a situation in your case you're saying that um there's a, a crossover between some of the reports of depression and the reports of sickness behavior in terms of how we that how they how they appear um that's i think it is a really uh, interesting thing that sometimes our words and categories and labels we put on things can limit us or um restrict restrict us uh, i think that's a really really interesting point and it's very it's very tricky actually in terms of trying to explain these quite this this sort of fundamental concepts that are fundamentally different to what we're used to in science and language and in the, in the realm of mental health the, the the words and labels and categories which in a sense we have to use to make sense of the world mm. um do limit us um so when i say depression depression is not there's not it's not one disease it's many different things and has many different causes um yeah which which does complicate things but i think it's a it's a messy but interesting interesting area uh, you're right it is is messy but life is you know it's it is uh, messy. What, what, one of my favorite phrases is that I can't, I think it's from, um, I can't remember now. It's uh, the, the, the universe is a communion of subjects, not just a collection of objects. So that, you know, all these relationships, uh, um, something like a, a sickness behavior or a, a state of chronic um, low mood or depression um, might be influenced by all these, you know, reciprocal feedback loops that mm. talk to each mm. other of a bit of inflammation some expectations around how we should be operating in the world and you know short-term long-term stresses maybe some nutrition as well they all kind of and what we don't want is for them to feed into a vicious cycle or to kind of uh, turn into some narrowing of our life you want to find a way to kind of open things up again and if that involves some you know uh work with our uh challenging or exploring mental functions or you know um, some other lifestyle interventions that can kind of untangle that knot then um then great yeah definitely i think i would you, you made me think of something quite interesting i when i was in in sweden i i um took one of the um 
uh, the PhD theses of one of this um, the professor's students. Um, I've just got, just got here to remember the the, the, um, the the new doctor's name, Marta uh, Zakzuska, I think. And it's but it's, it's interesting because she's, she's been working on how um, the relationship between olfaction, smelling, and disgust associated with, with with smelling different different things can be associated with prejudice of other people. Uh, and some of the research, I mean, I'm, I'm only starting to get through it, but um, the idea is that actually um, people who have a stronger, um, high sensitivity to, to, to disgust when they smell different things um, tend to be more prejudiced about other people and how that sort of, how kind of bio, these loops and this, this biology um, influences um, society and sociology and, and vice versa and things like that. And things that we just never thought were interconnected are. So I think that's, that's what's really mm. Well, yeah, I can imagine that, you know, again, in terms of adaptation, that that the ability to be disgusted might be useful if, uh, you know, stop you eating food that's gone off or to wallow in a cesspit. You know, it's great that I get disgusted by those sorts of things. Yeah, but yeah. but if I learn that, um, you know, I start to create these predictions or expectations around things that um, someone tells me is dis- disgusting, then then that might not be a good thing um, overall. Mm. Um, so I just want, if we could just go back to the, um, your experience in, uh, with Matt Lakanda and mm-hmm. the, you were given a, a, a vaccine, typhoid fever vaccine. Mm. Um, so just to be clear that you, you got that, you, after that, uh, exposure, you experienced sickness behavior, mm. um, like many people will do after some vaccine, but that you didn't mm. actually have typhoid infection at all even mildly so it wasn't even an act you know it wasn't didn't have the ability to make you sick yeah but your body gave you uh, a response a sickness response um yes yes that, that that's yeah good to good to clarify that yes it was just contained a bit of the capsule of the um salmonella enterica typhi bacteria basically so just a harmless bit of um bacteria um but my you know within you know, within minutes of it being injected into me, my <clears throat> immune cells, my sort of the front line of my immune response called the innate immune system was they, they, the cells have little barcode readers on them, essentially for kind of, these are these are genetically um, transmitted, so germline encoded, genetically encoded barcode um, readers for common bacterial um, um, sort of patterns. And they could detect that this is a, a foreign uh, bacteria, not, you know, it was a foe, not a friend. And then they started to secrete molecules that were initiating an uh, inflammatory response. Uh, obviously, the aim of a vaccine is to create memory, so that take, that takes a few days. But there's an initial response within the first couple of hours. Um, but those molecules were already communicating with my brain, and within about an hour or two, I essentially withdrew myself from my friends who I, I was with. I so went curled up into a ball in my bed. I um, had no desire to do anything, not even sort of look at something on Netflix. Um, it was about seven in the evening, I, and I sort of, was incredibly fatigued and eventually fell, fell asleep. Um, had no desire to have breakfast the next morning, and all of these things are actually the idea is it, it takes it takes me away from others, so I'm less at risk of infecting others or um, exposing myself to other infections. But what's also interesting is that. Um, some of their um, so Matt's, Matt's lab and other labs have done research into what they call the behavioral immune system, which is the, well, the best thing to do is not to get infected, is to avoid other people. So we're very good at being able to detect whether people are infected, even if we can't describe how it is. So they've done studies where you can see, you can tell just by the, the way that someone's walking that they have an infection, even if you can't really put it into words how what, what the differences are or in their sort of facial color. Um, and they also did a study where um, when people were smelling sweaty T-shirts of people who had uh, who'd been infected, um, they were more likely to uh, dislike the sweat of those who'd been infected compared to those who hadn't and, and things like that. So it's, um, it's, it's really interesting from a sort of behavioral point of view. Mm. Um, and, yeah. and the idea that this, this also changes in terms of our, in, in terms of our exposure. So we, pregnant women are much more likely to uh, to be disgusted by specific foods um, to reduce the risk of uh, an infection affecting the fetus. Um, 
So I think sort of a greater understanding of that gives us a greater understanding of uh, life in general, but also of um, what we classify as sort of dysfunction in mental health, essentially. But it, it gives us a more nuanced view and hopefully can potentially result in some treatment. Mm hmm. Mm. So, um, yeah, and I think, uh, so where do you, can you see any sort of obvious quick wins with this, this, mm. these new bits of um, research that you're learning about? Where, where do you think the future will be for your own research and others who want to um, use all of this knowledge to, to help people? Yeah, it's a, um, yeah, really interesting. It, it, it depends on what the, what, what, you know, what the areas or the condition is and things like that. I mean, lots of people are looking for anti-inflammatory treatments for depression in a sense which at which i know that there isn't there isn't really one at the, at the moment and that might be useful for some people but i think it's important as well to as you were saying to, to tackling it from both ends top down and bottom up um and understanding that various psychological therapies uh, alongside um the physical element of it can be hugely beneficial and can actually change um can act, uh, and can change the immune system as well um i think in the gut microbiome there's a lot of evidence coming through that dietary changes as well can be really helpful so that's basically increasing fiber it's increasing the variety of um plant-based foods um that you have and also introducing fermented foods um and that's something that i've been after um understanding the research that's something i've been doing for sort of six months now and actually i think it's there's a lot of evidence that it helps kind of when you when you're you are you're inevitably exposed to stresses you're better equipped to deal with them um through various complicated routes but actually and I, and I found that really beneficial for my kind of, sort of um just generally sort of navigating my way through life um between yeah my my mind and my body and um so I think those are those are some some quick wins I think done some dietary changes but also I think but in terms in terms of um specific treatments and things like that um not necessarily there yet, but I don't think we should be looking at it from a, you know, we need this pill or this thing to change the immune system and then it will make your mental health better necessarily, I think. Um, I, I think an understanding of the relationship between the mind and the body can be, if if incorporated in a treatment, so using the border back pain study, for example, is a good, good example of that, can be a really effective treatment in and of itself. Mm. You've been really generous, Monty. Thank you with all that uh, download of, of information. Um, any final comments or, uh, and where can we find out more about your work? Um, I mean, I, th I, I don't think I've got any extra comments. That was the great questions. I mean, probably uh, raised more questions that I've, I've given answers, but that's what I, I like about um, science. Um, you can find, so in terms of my, um, my books, you can find them on, uh, so I've got our website, montylyman.com. Uh, if you want to buy it, try a local bookshop. Um, but that should be sold in any reputable bookstore, really. So it's the painful truth. It's all about pain. And if you're interested in the skin, but also the, the sort of the relationship between skin and society and skin and the mind, uh, then the remarkable life of the skin is my And I'll link to um, your website from the description of this video. Brilliant. Thanks, Ian. Thanks very much. And I look forward to uh, reading your new book when it's published. Thanks. Great chatty. And thank you. Please remember to subscribe to the Inner Sense channel for more information about the role of your bodily sensations and tips for using bodily awareness to improve your well-being.